Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at iron and steel, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and the role of scientists. We hear now from Dr Rob Robinson about the fishing industry. I'm Dr Rob Robinson. I'm a maritime historian. I'm an honorary research fellow at the University of Hull in the Maritime Historical Studies Centre. The fishing industry of the British Isles on the outbreak of the Great War was the largest and most modern in the world. It covered the whole of the British Isles, but its two leading sectors were the Scottish herring drift fishery and the steam trawling sector. The steam trawling sector particularly saw whitefish, cod, haddock and the like, generally for the home market, particularly for the burgeoning fish and chip trade. The herring industry, in contrast, pursued fish seasonally, different races of herring that shoaled at different places on the British coast. Much of the fish that they caught was salted, packed in barrels and destined for the overseas market. But in addition to that, they produced a large amount of smoked herring, known as kippers, for the breakfast table. So they were the two leading sectors. The trawl sector was very highly capitalised. It used up-to-date modern vessels. The main companies involved in it were joint stock limited liability companies. The herring industry, in contrast, was based largely on fishermen who owned their own vessels, steam drifters and sailing drifters. The curers played a big role in their industry. They were the people who processed the fish and they often lent capital. In contrast to those two large and very advanced sectors, there were a myriad of small ports around the British Isles and groups of fishermen who pursued a whole variety of different fish. Many of these industries were undercapitalised. Across the Irish Sea, in Ireland itself, the two main sectors were the herring and the mackerel fisheries, and again, a lot of their product went overseas. Irish fisheries traditionally very undercapitalised as well, but there was a growing steam trawling sector largely based on the port of Dublin. Back in the middle of Edward VII's reign, probably one of the most intriguing maritime conflicts of that period was the Russo-Japanese War. We're not going to get into that now, but one outcome of the Russo-Japanese War was the extensive use of mines, sea mines, as a means of disposing of vessels. Immediately afterwards, both sides involved in the Russo-Japanese War and other countries, including Britain, were taxed with the idea of how do you deal with mines? How do you remove them from the sea? And as a result of that, and experiments that took place in Britain, the method of mine sweeping came up. And through that, it was decided to form a new section of the Royal Naval Reserve, which would be known as the Royal Naval Reserve Trawler Section. The idea of this section was that it would recruit a substantive number of fishermen, in the end, something in the region of about 1,400, and a substantive number of fishing vessels, slightly more than 100. The people on them and the vessels themselves were rigged and trained so that they could be brought into service very quickly in terms of the war, for minesweeping duties. On the outbreak of the First World War, these vessels were taken into service. The immediate response of the Admiralty at the outbreak of the Great War was to ban all fishing vessels from the North Sea. They realised it was going to be a war zone. They thought that fishing vessels would either get in the way or perhaps be used as a means of getting saboteurs or spies into the country. So for a few weeks, all fishing was banned from the North Sea. But quite quickly ships returned under Admiralty supervision, in theory, in practice, often doing what they wanted to do. The fishing industry in the war was going to have three roles to play. The first of these roles was minesweeping. This had already been identified before the war, but it was seen quite quickly that insufficient minesweepers and crew had been trained in the techniques of minesweeping and indeed enrolled in the trawl reserve. Far more were going to be needed. The second rule was for patrol duties, particularly anti-submarine patrol work and various other activities. And it was soon realised that large numbers of the more modern fishing vessels were going to have to be taken into Admiralty service, armed and put on service. And the third rule, of course, the traditional rule of the fisheries, was to try to maintain what was going to become the beleaguered nation's food supply. Quite quickly, a large number of fishermen who were already in the Royal Naval Reserve proper the existing Royal Naval Reserve, particularly 
large numbers in places like the Western Isles and in Orkney and Shetland to a degree, they went into service quite quickly. So they were immediately withdrawn from the equation. In other places, the take-up of fishermen was less fierce but unrelenting. Before the Great War, they'd said that a lot of the vessels that would be taken up would be just steam trawlers. But in actual fact, it turned out that they took large numbers of steam trawlers and large numbers of steam drifters. The more modern ones were generally taken. They became men of war. In the case of the patrol vessels, they were armed from quite early on in the war. Their crews were expected to take part in all sorts of naval activities. Minesweepers, generally at the beginning of the war, were unarmed because there weren't enough guns to go around, but they had jobs to do. The fishermen who were left fishing, whether on trawlers or drifters or on the myriad of smaller vessels around the coast, they were to operate on what was the maritime front line. So their activity, unlike that of many other people, actually took place in a war zone. Now, the war zone initially was probably the North Sea and the Channel, but increasingly, as the war went on, and submarines became more bold, and as mine-laying activities were diffused around the coast, that activity embraced the whole of the coast. So there were very few fishermen working off the British coasts who were not actually working at one stage or another in a war zone. Many of their colleagues who had been taken into service not only saw service all the way around the British Isles, but they saw service as places as far flung as the White Sea, where they were on minesweeping duties up there, and of course the Eastern Mediterranean, where they were not only working the Dardanelles campaign, but various other areas. And in between you found them at places like Italy, Gibraltar, and all over the place. So the fishing industry, its personnel, were taken up in an enormous way. One of the great frustrations, I think, of this four years of commemoration of the Great War has been that when the Great War at Sea has been looked at, it's largely been looked at from the perspective of dreadnoughts, Jutland, and perhaps, to some extent, the U-boat war. But when you look at the Great War at Sea, what was going on around our coasts on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis, the fishermen were on the front line. If you were able to drain the North Sea, all the way along the British East Coast, you would see a battlefield. This is the area of what became known as the East Coast War Channels. These were channels of water that were kept, swept as clean as possible. They're the focus of the areas. And they were where the mercantile marine ships would have to come up and down the coast. The thing was that the Germans obviously were trying to strangle our supplies of trade and provisions that were coming in, raw materials, etc. If they'd been able to do that, they'd been able to degrade our ability to wage war. And they tried to strangle this by the means of laying mines or by working with U-boats that attacked vessels. The fishermen had the job of taking on these vessels in that area. And this, as I say, is a forgotten war. I've been involved very much in an in-depth analysis of one vessel, still survives, Her Majesty's trawler Viola. It lies today down at South Georgia. That vessel entered Admiralty service in September 1914. An analysis of its logs and the auxiliary patrol reports show that that was in service week after week, month after week, throughout the war. And in that period of time, it steamed far more miles than any dreadnought, was involved in numerous encounters with enemy submarines and involved in the direct sinking of two of them. The Troll of Viola had been built for the whole what's called North Sea Boxing Fleets to troll in the North Sea in 1906. And on the outbreak of war, it was requisitioned and taken into naval service and spent the full period of naval service working either off the coasts of Shetland, which it did largely for the first couple of years of the war, or working off the north east coast of England from the port of Newcastle from the Tyne. And it spent that full period of time on war duties. Its crew were fishermen drawn initially from the port of Hull, supplemented by people from the Shetland Islands. Initially, it was armed very poorly with a three-pounder gun, which was later replaced by a six-pounder gun and then by a 12-pounder gun. The crew initially had what they called an explosive sweep, which was something they towed in the water behind them. And if it came in contact with a submarine, it was exploded. Very poor and very basic. Later in the war, it was also armed with depth charges. And in addition to that, it was fitted with hydrophones, an early form of electronic listening device. And by 1918, both vessel and crew were a formidable fighting unit. After the war, 
It was sold to Norway. It was used for fishing and then for whaling. And eventually it ended up in South Georgia where it was used for sealing work and also in the off season for patrol work or exploration work. The vessel still lies there to this day. And there is a bit of a campaign going on to try to return that vessel, which is one of the few surviving vessels of the Great War. And this is the one that saw more action with any of the enemy vessels than any other. The other three are HMS Caroline in Belfast. There's a monitor which is stationed down at Portsmouth and there is another vessel on the Thames. The fishermen who were left fishing had a heck of a job to do. The numbers of vessels, efficient vessels, that were left were very few. They had to rely very heavily on older vessels, sailing vessels, small open boats around the coast. The overseas market for herring and the like disappeared because much of it had been in Eastern Europe or Central Europe or even Germany. And the focus was increasingly put on the home market. It was a very important job that they had to do. In order to do that effectively, various things changed. Prior to the war, a series of conservation measures had been taken, certainly around the English coast, to reduce overfishing in inshore waters. That was altered not long after the war started. Vessels were left to be able to fish as intensively as they could. Conservation would have to wait until after the war. The other big thing that began to be developed was motorisation of the fishing fleets. Many of the inshore fleets were woefully undercapitalised. They still relied on sail or oar for motive power for their vessels. Prior to the war, people like the Irish Fishery Board, back in about 1907, had taken the lead in trying to develop motorisation. Motorisation made fishing vessels much more efficient. And when the war came, this was continued, this process. And by 1617, there were quite a lot of facilities in place to encourage motorisations and schemes laid out whereby fishermen could be encouraged to take out loans to fund the motorisation of vessels. Once a vessel was motorised, it could get in and out from the fishing grounds more quickly. It could haul pots and other gear much more efficiently as well. And generally, it could work with a smaller crew. And really, it was the war that transformed that dimension of the fishing industry. You go to any inshore fishing port or fishing port today, even the small vessels in virtually all places around the British Isles are motorised. It was not an easy thing to do. The fishermen themselves weren't mechanically orientated. They hadn't any experience of this. People had to be trained to maintain these vessels and to install the motors. The supply of fuel had to be facilitated and all the other gear associated with them had to be acquired as well. Other vessels were modified as best as possible. Quite often this meant a number of sailing vessels that had previously been used for line fishing turned over to trawling, for example, which meant you got a larger quantity of fish. The other thing was that from early 1915, certainly from April 1915, fishing vessels began to be specifically targeted by the enemy. The first period of unrestricted submarine warfare had started in February 1915. That doesn't mean to say fishing vessels hadn't been lost before then, but they'd been lost or they'd been destroyed or their crews captured in the course of other naval operations that were taking place in the North Sea. But from this day, vessels were sunk and they were sunk in quite substantial numbers. Typically, with a larger vessel, the submarine would surface a shot would be fired over the bows of the unarmed fishing vessel. The crew would be then ordered by loud hailer to get in their rowing boat and row across to the deck of the submarine where they would be lined up. The crew of the fishing vessel would be left there whilst the sailors from the submarine or a group of them would go back to the trawler and fix explosive charges. In other cases, that wasn't done. The vessel was just shelled. After the vessel had begun sinking, the fishermen were normally allowed to get back in their rowing boat and head for shore. And there were large numbers of fishing vessels lost, but large numbers of crew who survived. There were a few cases of reported atrocities, where a submarine submerged without letting the crew back in the boat and left them floundering around in the water, and a few who didn't make it back because their open boats were lost in the sea. But on the whole, most of them who were victims of submarine warfare in that sense survived. Others, of course, though, were unwittingly lost as a result of encountering mines and being blown up. Quite clearly, the catch of the British fishing industry dropped during the war. Certainly in Scotland and England and Wales, that was the trend. And that was because a large number of the fishing vessels had been taken and also because 
there were very few people left fishing. Fishing was increasingly left in the hands of people over military age or people too young to be taken up by the military. The exception to that rule was Ireland. The fishing industry of Ireland was initially denuded, a number of fishing vessels taken for military service, there's your steam vessels, and also a number of people who were in the reservists called up. But they didn't get taken from that period onwards into naval service in a large numbers. What you find is that the numbers of people involved in fishing in Ireland doesn't decline at all in the long term over the war, and neither does the catch. And if anything, the catch is slightly higher at the end of the war than it is at the beginning. Having said that, the fishing industry of Ireland only provided a very small part of the total contribution of the catch of the British Isles. The supply of fish was dropping throughout the war until in the middle of 1918 it starts to rise again as enemy activity begins to fall away. Fish, unlike many other products, was never rationed during the war. It wasn't rationed because the supply was so volatile in many respects. And for much of the war, there was a great deal of inflation in terms of fishing. So if you were able to actually remain fishing and not lose your vessel to either Admiralty service or enemy action, then the lucrative returns were really good for fishermen. A lot of fishermen, and in the case of the steam trawlers that left, the owners did exceptionally well in that period of time and were able to accrue quite large sums of money. This was felt by some to be slightly immoral in later stages of the war, and from March 1918, a price ceiling was implemented in theory, which meant that fish couldn't be sold above a certain price. Having said all that, it was an incredibly difficult occupation. Fishing is normally the most dangerous civilian activity in the country anywhere, and of course the war merely had another dimension. The catch had dropped to something like a third of its pre-war level, but when you compare that with the way the fishing industry of Germany performed, this is a lot better. Prior to the war, large numbers of women worked as fish curers. The herring lasses, as they were particularly known, who came from the ports of northern Scotland down to the Northumberland coast, they followed the herring fleets around the country and they did the job of gutting and packing fish. That was their main source of income. When the war came, that went. But you do find that large numbers of women are taken up for all sorts of other duties. For example, anti-submarine nets and the likes had to be made. These were actually used at sea by drifters who had previously hung drift nets were now hanging anti-submarine nets. It's very difficult to unpick how many women actually went physically fishing during the war. You get no reports generally of this from most places. But it is evident from a few sources that a few women did. The best example is the life of a woman called Ella Trout. And Ella Trout came from the village of Hall Sands in Devon. And Hall Sands largely disappeared during the war. It was eroded. It was lost to the sea. She came from a family where the normal male breadwinners were on military service. So from a young age, from her teens, she supplemented their income during the war by going out fishing. On one occasion in the later stages of the war, whilst out fishing with her 10-year-old nephew, she rescued a seaman from a vessel which had been lost to a German submarine. As a result, her story became quite well known and she was awarded a medal. The reason we know of her is because of this heroic action, but there were probably a number of others in different places around the coast. The women, however, continued to be used for processing duties ashore. And of course, all fish needed processing to some degree to be forwarded on to market. Come the end of the war, fishermen were relatively rapidly demobilised. A group of them had to stay in naval service right through until late 1919. And that's because they were part of what was called the mine clearance service. All these mines had been laid by not only the British, but various other countries, Germans, of course, in large numbers, around the British coast, some for defensive reasons, which had minefields for that, others for offensive reasons. The Germans sometimes had, the British had offensive mines as well. All those mines had to be clear. Each country involved in the war had an obligation to clear these mines. And so Britain kept a mine clearance service. Although people from all sorts of backgrounds could come into it, it's quite clear that many of the people who did this job were actually fishermen. 
For others, the end of the war, of course, did not mean immediately the end of service. It probably took several months to wind down the auxiliary patrol forces. And there was one particular tragedy associated with this immediate wartime period that's worth a think about. This was the Isle Air disaster, 1st of January 1919. Large numbers of fishermen from the Western Isles, from Lewis and Harris, had joined up the Royal Naval Reserve or various other duties. The war had finished, of course, in November 1918, but these people remained on service. Large numbers of them elected to have New Year off. Their English counterparts went for Christmas. They tried to get back to the islands of Harris and Lewis on New Year's Eve. The ship that they were on, the Isle Air, was wrecked. Hundreds of fishermen were lost. These were fishermen crofters, people who had, during the war, had been on the front line but had survived and ironically lost their lives on the shores of their home islands. Mines, loose sea mines, continued to take fishermen to the bottom for several years after the war. With regard to the industry itself, it emerged into a completely new economic order. Prior to the war, the herring industry was based largely on Scotland, dominated by Scottish curers who sent it to overseas markets, to places like Germany, and the Eastern European states. After the war, the Russian market was closed thanks to the Bolshevik Revolution. The German market was impoverished, and many of the smaller areas that they'd sent fish to had become independent states, keen to develop their own economies. So the overseas market for herring was drastically reduced. The herring industry, as it had traditionally been constituted, never recovered. It entered a downward spiral that lasted until the 1950s. The whitefish trawling industry also suffered quite acutely after the war. Once fish prices began to fall, many of the smaller, less efficient ports found that they couldn't make fishing worthwhile. But the big trawling ports, places like Hull and Grimsby, to some extent overrode this. They built the most modern vessels. They went to distant waters to catch fish rather than the North Sea, and they brought their catches back to sell to the still burgeoning fish and chip market. Smaller trawling ports didn't do so well. And the mass of very small fishing ports, a number of them see fishing almost completely cease in the decades after the First World War. And that trend, of course, has continued to this day. That was Dr Rob Robinson on the fishing industry You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Keith Greaves about agriculture during the First World War.